Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. If you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24, if you do not have a Bible, there are free ones in the pews in front of you or the seats in front of you. Uh, the colored ones there are for you if you would like to grab that, put your name in it, and we'll fill it, fill it in this week. We'll replenish our supply. So thank you for being here, and thank you for letting me continue to switch our series right now. We were in the book of Acts, but right now we're in a new series called Discerning the Times because of what's going on in our world. If you did not get a chance to be here last week, I want to encourage you to watch my message last week. It's on YouTube at Calvary Dover is our handle for that. We're discussing basically the times and do they match what we're seeing in today's times? And the quick answer is yes, so we can all go home now. Uh, but we want to look at them more deeply here and, and just make sure we're ready. Uh, Jesus is actually, in Matthew 24, Jesus is uh, actually trying to help us be ready, and he also says be watchful too. That's what he tells the church to do. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, by the way, we, uh, we definitely love Thanksgiving too. Just because we have trees up already <laughs> does not mean that we're not about Thanksgiving. <laughs> we're just getting ready for our Christmas show, Noel, and we're de we decorated in the lobby a little bit, getting ready for um, Operation Christmas Child. But I promise you, we like Thanksgiving, okay? I know I do. So anyway, we have changed our subject of our series right now as well because of the times. But I want to put this out there too. Um, this, this series isn't meant to cause anxiety in your life. Okay, I want to put that out there. Um, our end times teachings and scripture are they serious? Yes, they are. But as a pastor, it's my job and responsibility to teach you the Bible, and some things are serious and, and intense, and some things aren't, okay? And right now, you know, a lot of people are having questions about what's going on, and what Jesus says in our scripture, you'll see it today, he says, don't be alarmed or don't panic. So the idea isn't for you to be scared or alarmed or panic. The idea is for you to be aware and be um, in the know, and so you're not surprised, all right? And so you can actually be comforted and have confidence. So let's jump right in so we can see even those words. But Jesus is telling his church to be ready and to be watchful, not to panic, not to be alarmed. And so let's see that. But our, our message today, and it's, it's a serious one, and they're really all of these are kind of serious because we care about our eternity, right? And we care about the eternity of, of those who don't know Jesus yet. And uh, the, the title of this one is the, the Deception and Apostasy of Many. And apostasy means to fall away from the faith. All right, and we're seeing that happening in our culture. And so Matthew 24, uh, Jesus is warning them and he actually brings us attention to this actual sign three times, pointing to the severity of this in the last days, that this is gonna be something that we're gonna see happen quite a bit. So Matthew 24, verse 1, let's get into it here. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolish, demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Uh, AD 70, Rome destroyed the temple and there was no stone left on top of that temple. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will all this happen? And here's the big question. What sign or signs will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. Say mislead. mislead. Okay. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive. Say deceive with me. Deceive. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. There it is. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. And then it says in verse 9, then you will be arrested 
persecuted and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. I'm seeing that happening too. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. There's the apostasy. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Now, let me just stop there for a moment. Just because it says many people will be deceived doesn't mean the majority of people will be deceived. Many people will also believe in Jesus Christ. So there's going to be many people who are affected by the false teaching, but there's going to be many people who are not affected as well, and they're going to believe. So praise the Lord for that. All right? Sin will be rampant everywhere. Does that sound familiar? And the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, say endures. That's us. We're going to endure. Amen? Amen. To the end, we'll be saved. And here's some good news. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. So we're going to stop there for a moment. Another sign of the end and return of Christ is the increase of deception and apostasy. Religious deception will be openly practiced and taught on the earth. And we're not talking about wickedness uh, this week. We're talking about the, the deceiving of the deception of people. Um, this is very insidious. It's just as bad as wickedness. Because what's going to happen is they're going to take parts of the truth and then add in their lies, and so it looks like truth. And so it's very deceptive. And again, Jesus warned them three times in this chapter to look out for this. And the particular form of deception that he was saying was like, they, and they were using at this time, was, hey, you'll, you'll see the Messiah, he's over here, or you can find him over here in the desert. And, and he actually corrects that. And I'm going to get into that in a moment, but he was saying that's not how it's going to be. The Messiah will show up in a way you'll know for sure. It will be unmistakable. Here's what we do know. Deception comes from the devil, doesn't it? He's been doing that since the garden. He deceived Adam and Eve. He's been working hard to deceive everyone. Look at 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. Are you ready for this? And things taught by demons. People don't realize that. But the religions, the different religions, the different beliefs, the different systems out there have actually been created by the devil, have been disseminated by demons, and now people are teaching these things. It's the progress of the devil deceiving people through his demons given demonic teachings to people, and they'll receive these things through some kind of vision or something like that. You've heard of these different kind of religions, okay, and they receive these things. Now, I would say those are demons because there's only one truth. And we as, as, as tr traditional, historical, biblical believers believe there's only one truth and nothing else is true except for God's word and God's truth. All right, exclusivity is a factor in, in our faith, okay? We do believe that he is the absolute truth. And what's happening is the devil is creating deception and false religions and false teachings to distract people from knowing the truth of God and to sway people from going to heaven and being with, with the Lord. All right, so this deception has been going on. And just I want you to, to know this because what if your family or friends or, God forbid, one of us falls for teaching that comes from demons? We don't want to do that. It says this, such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. The verb here, hot iron, indicates this searing that has obliterated the ability to discern truth from falsehood. Have you ever seen, uh, have you ever been to one of those hotels where an iron's on the ground too long and you can see the iron mark? Maybe not. I did. <laughs> they didn't fix that carpet. They didn't fix that carpet. And someone left the iron there on the ground and it melted the carpet and when I went to touch it, it was hard. It was really hard. I probably should have got a different hotel now that I think of it. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but it, you could scratch it, and it was sounded hard. And basically what he's trying to say here is there will be teachers, people, who will be, their consciousness will be so seared that they won't feel conviction from the Lord. And even believers are like this, people who call themselves believers their consciousness will be so seared that if you try to tell them the truth or correct them for lying, they won't receive it because their surface is hard, okay? They, they can't receive. They can't absorb. It's been seared and hardened. 
And that's what's happening is, is false teachers, if you try to correct them, they won't even necessarily receive it. All right? And so he's warning that this is what's going to happen in the end. All right? It was happening then as well. Now, deception spreads through false teachers. I'm not going to take a lot of time with false messiahs. It's pretty obvious um, what false messiahs do. They, they parade around and go, I'm the messiah. And you're watching them on TV or in, in videos or in now documentaries, and you're like, you're not the messiah. Okay, where'd you come from? I didn't see you come down from the clouds yet. Because Jesus said that that's what we would see. All right, that's what the word of God says. The angels told the disciples when Jesus ascended into heaven, the angels said, you will see him appear again just like that. But he will come down from the clouds. So that's how you know the true Messiah is there. Let me read to you, though, in verse 23 of Matthew 24, verse 23. If anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. So this is the third time he's warned them. So if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't go bother to look. I like that. Look, he is hiding here. Don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so will be the Son of Man who comes. So will be the Son of Man that comes. So he's going to come from the sky. We're all going to notice it. It's going to be unmistakable. People are going to see it, and we're going to know that is the Messiah. That is Jesus Christ, okay? Now, here's what false messiahs are. False messiahs are master manipulators, intelligent. They have a haughty view of themselves. They're, you know, they, they love themselves a lot. They most likely are unwilling to sit under biblical, true biblical authority and leadership. They prefer to craft their own beliefs and teaching. They have evil motives to feed their need for self-glorification and find pleasure in power and position. And here's what Scripture says in 2 Timothy 3. I'm just going to paraphrase, but 2 Timothy 3, 6 and 7 actually refer to this, talk about this. And this is really about false prophets or teachers, but including false messiahs. They all have the same kind of um, MO about them, okay? But here's what, here's what I wrote down. They prey on the vulnerable, they prey on the hurting, the lonely, and those who lack knowledge of authentic faith. They prey on those people. If you look at the history of these false messiahs, they pull in people who need all that stuff. They know what they're doing. These false messiahs know what they're doing, and they're in it for the money. They're in it for a lot of bad reasons, okay? Now, false messiahs, um, definitely a different group of people, but false teachers and prophets are very similar in Scripture, okay? Because prophets speak for God, teachers teach for God, okay? So a false prophet or teacher is someone who's a messenger falsely speaking or teaching on behalf of God. And they were also motivated not by loyalty to God, but by pleasing kings in the Old Testament, especially by popularity, position, or money, uh, especially we've seen even in recent days or in recent times. An example of this is found in the book of Jeremiah and his contemporaries, so the other false, the false prophets. He was a true prophet of God, Jeremiah. In fact, actually, you ready for this? God told Jeremiah early on that they won't listen to you, but I still need you to go say it. That must be a miserable job. All right, he does it. He's, that's a true prophet, by the way. Someone who's willing to go obey God, even though he warned, God warned him that they won't even listen to you. But here's what happened. While Jeremiah was foretelling destruction coming on the people, the false prophets were assuring the people that there was no destruction. There was just peace coming. So they would lie. Now listen to this. Isaiah 30.10 in the NLT version, New Living Translation version. This is, what they, this is, this is how bad it got. Don't tell us what is right. This is what people wanted. Tell us nice things. Tell us lies. This is literally in the Bible. Isaiah 30, 10. Read it for yourself. They were so tired of God's prophets speaking truth and the, the condemnation, so to say, the judgment that was coming upon them for their sins 
They were like, we're tired of this. Just bring in some false prophets to give us something that we're going to like. But that's false security. And God, God tells you the truth, not so you, you know, feel terrible about yourself, but so you will reform and change and come back to a right relationship with him. We're going to hear some scripture later on in a moment. But what makes, uh, to go along with that, but what makes someone a false teacher? And I think this is important because in Christianity, we have different denominations with different distinctive perspectives on scripture. So in other words, this church may not agree with another church on certain verses in the Bible. That doesn't make us a false church or them a false church. We just disagree with uh, our interpretation of that scripture. So my brothers and sisters in Christ who don't agree that the gifts of the Spirit continue today, they're called cessationists, okay? And uh, I disagree with that. They believe that the gifts of the church have ceased for today. They're no longer in operation, okay? What you read about in the book of Acts happening, what you read about in 1 Corinthians 12, all the gifts of the church, they believe that those things were for a a time but not for, for now. Okay, I disagree with that. I'm a continuous. I believe that these gifts continue, all right? My main argument is this. The purpose of the gifts were to build up the church, okay, until into full uh, maturation or maturity in Christ. Has the church fully grown to become like Christ? No, we got a lot of work to do. So we still need the gifts. And the church needs to operate in the gifts, okay? We need to use our giftings, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week, encouraging speaking for God, all the different things, hospitality, serving. We need to be doing all those things, all right? Now, does that mean that they are, they are false teachers and prophets because we disagree? No, but I will say I'm getting concerned, okay? I got brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ who sit in that camp, but I'm not gonna call them a false preacher or teacher, okay? Let me give you examples of what would be. Uh, denying Jesus as the son of God and he's just a prophet, that is a false teaching, okay? Because it has to do with a core doctrine of our belief that he is God in flesh, okay? Um, How about this? Faith or, or salvation comes not by faith but through works and good deeds. That is a false teaching because someone will live their life trying to do good things and think they'll get to heaven and they're wrong. So that's a very bad teaching. Here's, here's one that goes, these two go hand in hand, and I've been hearing this more and more. Hell doesn't exist, and everyone goes to heaven. That's very convenient, isn't it? And those go hand in hand because people want to live however they want to live in the middle. I'm not going to go to hell, so I can live how I want. I'm going to go to heaven, so I'm good. I can still live how I want, and that's not true. So those, are, those to me, I would go, you're a false teacher. You're a false preacher, okay? Um, but when we have arguments over certain perspectives of Scripture, it's a little different for me. All right, so there's core doctrines that we, we hold on to. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, though, goes a little bit further in defining what a false teacher looks like and does. 2 Peter uh, 2, 1 through 3, but there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you, They will cleverly teach destructive heresies, which means false teachings, and even deny the master, God, or Jesus, the Lord, who bought them, who paid for their their sin on the cross. They'll deny him. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. In other words, these teachers are going to live shameful lives, sinful lives. And, and people are going to follow them. And because of these teachers, the way of the truth will be slandered. So the truth that we, that we believe is going to be slandered. It's going to be attacked. Isn't that happening today? In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. So typically, false teachers were in it for the money, for the following and to distort teachings or conduct to fit their desires. One of the big ones that the church was dealing with in the first century was called Gnosticism. It's where the, uh, Gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. It had to do with a special knowledge. And here's what Gnosticism essentially was. 
It was that physical matter was evil, okay, entirely evil, but spirit is entirely good. Okay, now let me, just follow me here for a second. So basically what they believed was that what you did with your body, it didn't matter because it was already evil anyway. And what you, what you believed in here was what mattered the most. That turned into a very evil teaching and belief that you could do whatever you want with your body as long as you had the right beliefs. Doesn't that sound familiar today though? I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, but their lives don't look like it. Jesus cares about what we do with our bodies. Jesus confronted, yeah, amen. Jesus confronted us and said, your eye is a lamp to the soul. Your eye can cause, in fact, it's, it's what goes in and then stays and resides in there that corrupts a person. Okay, so it, it matters what we do with our bodies. So people f- um, started following Gnosticism and then it branched off into this insidious belief that it didn't matter what you did with your physical body. So it f- people fell into sexual immorality back then. Now, the Romans and the Greeks, they practiced that already. They were looking for ways to live this way and still go to heaven. Doesn't that sound familiar today? Believe in what we want to believe, do what we want to do, um, you know, affirming things we shouldn't be affirming because I still believe in Jesus, so I'm, I'm covered by grace. I'm covered by Jesus. But your convictions haven't changed. Your standards have not changed with it. Be careful of people who teach this garbage. Okay? Now, let me give you some living examples today. And I don't mean to be condemning of anyone. Um, and I'm also uh, praying for this whole situation. And I just feel like as a pastor, it's my job to shepherd the flock and protect you. And that means I also have to inform you on things so that you can look out for your family, your kids. But also, I always think about your family uh, that are not in your home, your relatives. And I think about your kids' friends. And I think about the lost out there who need Jesus, so that you're aware of this. So uh, I have friends in the Methodist church. But if you're not aware, the Methodist uh, church is going through quite a shaking because over 6,000 churches have disaffiliated over the topic of LGBTQ plus uh, clergy. And whether clergy, pastors, should be, if they're LGBTQ+, are they allowed to be ministers and are they allowed to marry people? And so this has caused a huge rift in this faith or in this uh, denomination, in this fellowship. And so over 6,000 churches have pulled out of that, of that Methodist church um, because they want to hold on to a biblical, traditional worldview, historical worldview of those topics. All right? And I would agree with them. Unfortunately, the Methodist church has opened the doors to this belief system, all right? And it's caused many to fall away from the Lord. The problem is it's a slippery slope. Now even more things are being taught. So let me just show you uh, a couple of pictures. And I do this to only edify us and to prepare us, okay? Um, this is not to publicly shame anyone. And I pray for these people. This first picture and I'm not going to say everything he said because it would be wrong for me to say in this room. I don't even feel comfortable saying what I'm about to say. But this is literally what your kids are watching on social media. Okay? This gentleman here said, drag is holy. And he began to teach how God is okay with all of it. I thought it was fake. I thought it was a joke. And that's not even a joke. You shouldn't joke of that to call something like that holy. So I made sure I verified, and it's true. And this is happening, this is rampant on social media platforms, okay? This next one is really disturbing. Um, This pastor, that, not that one, that's me, but. (laughs) How about a little levity, huh? And the seriousness, but that's serious. 
This is a pastor who is introducing kids to this drag life. And this is happening in churches in America, okay? And here's the thing. We, we pray for these people, right? These are young kids. And the Bible is clear in Luke 17. It would be better you tie a millstone around your neck than to cause little ones to, t- to, to fall into sin. But what concerns me is this pastor to the left used Romans 12 too. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. He used that in the wrong way, saying, you don't, don't conform. He actually used it. He said, don't conform to the patterns of this world, but he's doing that. And so this is what's being, just, this is the, slope, the slippery slope that's taking place because we, we allow one thing to be okay with it because of social pressure, because of persecution, because of affirming everything that people want us to affirm. We're not helping people, we're hurting people when we do that. It's concerning, isn't it? And I show you those things to be aware that um, if your kids are sleeping over at someone's house and they're going to church, what church are they going to? Or your neighbors who are looking for a church, you may want to invite them to this church so they don't go to another church like that. Okay? And this, I verified these kind of things with my pastors who are Methodist. Now, those weren't necessarily Methodist churches. This is happening in Unitarian ones, Episcopal, and others. Okay? So I'm not trying to say it's, that's all Methodist churches. All right? But this is concerning, and I want people to know the truth. So here's the question, okay? I think I've gotten the serious stuff out quite a bit. Um, how do we be ready and avoid deception? Wouldn't that be important to answer before we go today? Number one, submit yourself to the reading and application of God's word. I put that first for a reason. I put that before going to church because you can read your Bible before you ever go to church, and you should, okay? Okay? We should be familiar with the Bible before we come to church. Now, I'm not saying you need to read the whole Bible before you ever attend a church. If you're new here, you're a guest, you're looking for a church, great. What I'm saying is read the Bible at the same time of looking for a church, okay, so that you know what to look for. Look at, listen to this, 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. Tell me if this doesn't sound like the old kings in the Old Testament who wanted the prophets to say whatever they wanted. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own, own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. That's happening today. Uh, the Bible is the safest source of truth. Church doctrines are founded in the Bible. Church teachings are founded in the Bible and they're substantiated by the Bible. In other words, Scripture proves Scripture. I'm saying this to say this. Read the Bible before you start listening to everyone else because the Bible will prove what you need to know. Okay? Amen. As wickedness increases in our lands, the demand for false teaching will increase, won't it? As false teaching increases, deception and wickedness increase, so they work together. Unfortunately, those who can't accept and submit to God's written word keep false teachers in business. And many who do teach the word are persecuted and slandered for it. I've been slandered for it. False teaching disguises itself as truth And the ones who can't tell are those who don't know God's word. It's so important that you know the Bible. It's so important that you read. By the way, both Testaments, Old and New Testament, do not listen to this stuff about throwing out the Old. We wouldn't understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. Okay, we, we need the Old Testament to even grasp the beauty of the New Testament. We need both. I'm hearing of people saying, ah, we don't really focus on the Old Testament. What? We wouldn't know so much about prophecy being fulfilled, the character, the nature of God, the truths of God, God's character, who he is. We wouldn't know a lot of that without the Old Testament. 
We wouldn't understand what's happening in Israel right now without the Old Testament. We need the Old Testament. Do not listen to people who teach. We just need the New Testament because we're a new covenant church. And Jesus came, the resurrection happened. That's all we need to focus on. No, we can't really appreciate that without the Old Testament. We need both. All right? At least a greater appreciation comes from that. All right. We can effectively, here's what's really cool. We can effectively discern because we have the word of God, the Bible, and the spirit of the word, the Holy Spirit. So while you're reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit helps you understand the Bible. John 16, 13 says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So when I'm reading the word of God, the Holy Spirit helps me and guides me confirming and affirming the truths that I have seen and heard through scripture and also in life. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. Let me keep moving forward because of time. Number two. So the first one was submit yourself to the reading application of God's word. Number two, join a church and listen to preaching, but be discerning. And I would say this, if you're going to watch things online, don't just watch it and receive it hook, line, and sinker. Be discerning. This is a little awkward because I'm a pastor, so I'm, this is kind of about me too, all right? But guess what? You have to apply scripture. But we need healthy biblical leadership. Amen. And here's why. Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. That was from Jesus. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Are we built up yet? Nope, so we still need the giftings. Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. See, you need good biblical teaching and pastors so that you don't fall for all the new winds of teaching that are going to come into play. So we need healthy, truthful, genuine prophets and teachers and pastors. And I strive to be that. All right, I do. I strive to be that. And this life verse of mine in 1 Timothy 4, I want you to hear it. 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 16. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. This is Paul talking to the young pastor, Timothy. He's writing this. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. I love this line. Watch your life and doctrine closely. So watch your life, your conduct, and your teaching carefully and closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. In other words, there is a great responsibility on me to make sure I'm telling you the truth so that you will also believe in salvation, so that you will believe in the truth and not fall away or fall for some kind of lie or deceiving teaching. There's a great responsibility on pastors, preachers, teachers, prophets, leaders to make sure they are watching their doctrine and their life closely. So we need them, but we need to be discerning. Matthew 7, 15 through 20, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. So you may think that someone that you're following or watching could be uh, this, this harmless sheep, but instead they have insidious motives behind and they're a wolf trying to trap you. We have seen people, even from this church, fall for those kind of things from other people they're listening to, other people they follow. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. 
So when we uh, go to church and we are listening to people or we, maybe you move away from Dover one day and you find another church, pay attention to their teaching and their conduct. Does the pastor teach unpopular scriptures or just the loving, feel-good scriptures? Does the pastor model an exemplary life or do they model a different kind of life that's wrong? Does the pastor, is the pastor there, the teacher there to serve or are they there to try to just get your money? These are things that we look out for. Uh, are, they, are they about getting glory for themselves or do they give glory to God? And I realize as a pastor that in a way you, you judge me in a healthy way, right? You have to discern my life and my character and my conduct and my teaching. And of course, is there any perfect teacher or prophet or pastor? No, nah, there's not. But I assure you, I just want to say this in front of everyone here. My, my end goal is to glorify God, to serve this church and be faithful to his word to the end, no matter what happens to me. Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Number three. All right, this is important. Because Jude, uh, in the, there's, there's actually a book in the Bible called Jude. It's uh, just one chapter, so it doesn't even have a chapter number. But Jude actually confronts the dangers of false teaching. And he ends the book with this, okay? Jude 20, oh, I'm sorry, let me give you the point. Number three, surround yourself with genuine believers that will help sharpen your journey. They care enough to help you grow. And sometimes that means being real. Jude 20 through 23 says, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. And await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Are we that kind of friend that if we see someone going down a wrong path, or someone who isn't even a believer, are we that kind of friend that will have a loving, truthful conversation with them despite what might come after that? Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others. Ready for this? But do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. In other words, while you're helping other believers that could be wavering and who are falling into sin, don't fall into sin yourself. Be careful. I want to give you a fair warning. When, you, um, when you're a friend like this, it doesn't mean you're always looking for the bad in someone. Okay, so let's be careful. Sometimes people go one extreme to the other. We got to be careful with that. All right, we encourage, we see the good, we, we praise God for the good that God's doing in life right? But sometimes there's just some obvious things in your friend's life who's a believer, who claims to be a, a follower of Christ, but they're falling for false teaching or falling for a false way of life. The Bible says to build each other up, to, to hold each other accountable here, to care enough to say something. Gently though, okay? All right? But I want to give you a fair warning that that won't always be accepted, you, you won't be liked sometimes when you do that. People won't receive that. Because I've done that in a loving way, the most loving way I can possibly do, and it wasn't received well at all. And I've cried over those situations. To gr I've grieved over those situations because these are people I love and I care about deeply. And so just, just a heads up, not everyone will receive your correction but it shouldn't stop you. You shouldn't be afraid to care enough to say something. Yes. We need, and here's, a, here's, are you ready for this? You need to be willing to receive it. We all need to be like willing to be cared for like that. If we're, if, you know, if we're 
found doing something we shouldn't be doing. Or maybe we go, hey, you should listen to this person. And you find out they're like way off in left field. You shouldn't listen to that guy at all. We should say something, right? Look out for false teaching because we don't want our friends or family to be deceived. Now, please be careful how you handle this. Okay, let, again, Scripture guide you on that. Amen? All right. Lastly, and I love this one. You know, we don't always have to be on the defense. We can go on the offense. The last one is fill the earth with truthful teachers. Sounds like a great idea. That's why we have a kids' ministry. That's why we have a youth ministry, young adult ministry. That's why we have small group ministry. That's why we have services on Sundays. We have prayer nights. We have uh, conferences and events. We're trying to fill the earth with the truth. And here's some good news. The Bible says that Jesus will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, a lot of people have not looked at that properly. They think hell comes against our gates. No, we storm darkness. We storm into the kingdom of darkness and the gates of hell can't hold us back. We're going to propagate truth. Amen. In other words, we're not supposed to consolidate ourselves to an island. We're supposed to take over the world with the truth of Jesus Christ. And the gates of hell won't be able to stop us. And that's why we do the things we do in this community. Because we want the truth to be out there. We want to be a light for our community. We want people to know the truth and not fall for lies and go to hell. We want them to go to heaven. And you know what? We're going to keep going. But one of the ways we start doing that is right here in discipleship. Right now, you have been receiving discipleship, training, and teaching in Christ, okay? But we need to carry that into our kids, any new believers who come here. We need to, and I'm going to keep saying this till the day I die. This will be, if I'm here until the day I die, this will be part of our DNA of the church. We need to open up our lives and welcome new people into them and help them follow Jesus. We do. (laughs) 2 Timothy 2. 1 and 2. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Four generations of truth keepers and teachers. Four generations. Paul to Timothy Now to the trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. We are supposed to spread the truth by our teaching and our examples as parents and as people of God. Amen? Amen. But also be spiritual parents for people. I just want to say thank you. Actually, why don't we stand together in closing? That's it. That's all I got today. That's enough. (laughs) (laughs) Praise the Lord. Now, are you clapping because I'm done? Or are you, no, no, just kidding. Oh, thank the Lord. I think the nursery workers are like, yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to thank you for the times I'm, I'm hearing stories. I'm hearing stories of people adopting, so to say, daughters and sons in Christ. They're adopting them. And they're helping them understand scriptures and helping them follow Jesus. I want to say thank you. That is what God has called us to do. When he said, go make disciples, that is a core tenet, core teaching of our church. Core value here. Go and make disciples. Stan, thank you for being a biblical teacher, brother. Thank you, small group leaders, for being biblical teachers. Thank you so much. Amen. Chris, thank you for the SEAL family going out into our schools doing CEF and Good News Clubs and all your volunteers. For the people who are evangelizing and making disciples that we don't see but the Lord sees, thank you. Let's give them a hand. We know you're doing it. I want to say thank you to you, though, for being hungry for truth. I'm seeing this church fill up week after week. God is building his church, and God is drawing in even people who weren't raised in church. They're coming here, and they're learning from the ground up who Jesus is and the truth of Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. And uh, I just want to say thank you for wanting the truth and allowing me to preach it. 
Thank you for allowing me the time to prepare too. This is no joke to me, this takes time. And it means a lot to me that I have a team that helps me carry this church forward and a board, the church board. But I, I'm comforted knowing that all of you are helping us reach this community and it just means a lot to me. And I just wanna say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping us do this. Amen. Amen. If, if you need to begin a relationship with Jesus today, we want to have adequate time for that. So I'm gonna have our prayer team members come up here right now and they're gonna wait till the end. And after, after the end, if you need prayer for anything or you're wanting to give your life to Jesus today, believe on him for salvation. Make him your Lord and Savior. They're gonna be here to talk you through with that, to start that relationship with God today. And if you need prayer for anything, healing, sickness, whatever it may be, uh, life, jobs, whatever, come on down. We'll pray for you as well. We do have our new here lunch getting ready to begin in here, but we have some time. We want to take time to pray for people's needs. Um, let's, let's pray to, though together in closing. God, we thank you for your presence in this place. That's so important. You are here and you dwell in your people. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. We thank you, God, that you look out for us and you warned us so that we would not be deceived or fall away. And Lord, we pray for your church to rise up and to teach and to train the next generation and the generation of now to be true keepers, true teachers, to reach the world. We thank you that we have the promise that you are building your church and hell won't be able to stop us. It may be hard. There may be some painful moments. There may be persecution. Actually, we know there will be. But God, we will endure and we will prevail. The church will prevail. We thank you for that, that promise. God, thank you that you told us to be ready. And your scripture in Matthew 24 says to be watchful. And so that's what we're doing. And we're not trying to scare anyone into the kingdom of God. We're not trying to scare believers today. We're just trying to make sure we are ready and aware so we can be confident and we can help build your kingdom here. We can spread your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that we are not surprised by what we're seeing. And our soul rests in you. And we look up waiting for your return. We can't wait. But we want to bring as many people as we can with us. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to still do that. Help us to do that, Lord. We love you. We give you glory and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday and a great week. Take care.